In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My very dear brothers and sisters, and our Lord Jesus Christ, and our Holy Mother Mary. When the Virgin Mary, our Heavenly Mother and Queen, appeared at Fatima, Portugal, in 1917. She came to us, her children, as any good mother would, to warn us of the impending dangers, calamities, catastrophes that would befall us in this, what historians have already labeled the bloodiest century in all of human history. And these are Our Lady's exact words. Russia will spread its airs throughout the world, provoking wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred and whole nations will be annihilated. No czar in St. Petersburg ever ruled with such absolute might as Gorbachev and the Politburo rule in the Soviet Union today. So we might ask ourselves, where, where are these communists? I think if we were to ask the average American today, they would say, well, they're all in the Kremlin. They're in Beijing. Happily, they're all behind the iron and bamboo curtain. What we fail to realize, there are two wings of the Marxist party, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. And where are these Mensheviks today? Well, there's quite a few of them in Washington, D.C. Perhaps the most prominent would be Zbigniew Brzezinski, the former national security advisor to President Carter. Now, he's often portrayed by our very leftist press as being anti-communist. He is not anti-communist. He's anti-Bolshevik. He's opposed to the tactics of the people in the Kremlin. But he wrote a book while at Columbia University entitled Between Two Ages, in which he hails Marxism as the wave of the future. Marxism, he says, is a triumph of reason over faith. It's a triumph of science, of mankind over superstition. Shortly after this book was published, David Rockefeller hired Brzezinski to be the director of the Trilateral Commission. John Dewey, also of Columbia University, no other individual in America has had more influence on public school education and so-called Catholic today than Mr. John Dewey. And his educational theories are that schools are not for the re purpose of training people how to read and write. They're training young people how to be socialists and how to live in a socialist society. This is why Johnny can't read anymore. This is why Johnny can't count anymore. And one of Dewey's disciples has publicly admitted it's not good to teach children how to read and write because then they become independent. Then they go off by themselves and start reading history and finding out what's really going on. No, the reason we have 27 million illiterate Americans today is because you've got to keep people ignorant in order to keep them under control. Who do you think was the first one ever to propose a national income tax? Were the salaries of every man, woman, and child who earned any income would autom automatically be taxed 
by the central government. You guessed it, Karl Marx. Have you ever read the Communist Manifesto? And the first plank of the Communist Manifesto is a national income tax on the salaries of every worker in the country. Well, the Mensheviks imposed that on us in 1913, the federal income tax. Prior to that, it was unconstitutional. Our founding fathers wanted to remove us as far as possible from Big Brother in Washington, D.C. So the only levy that the federal government could impose would be on the state. In this way, the states held the purse strings. So if the states didn't like what Big Brother was doing in Washington, they just wouldn't pay for it. Well, that fundamental American right and freedom was taken away in 1913. In 1987, the average worker in the United States, in order to pay his or her federal, state, and local taxes, had to work until May 4th. One-third of the year, four months, you and I had to work for the government because everything we earned in those four months, Uncle Sam took away from us. Now, in 1950, all we had to work was until February 13th. The second plank of the Communist Manifesto is the abolition of real money, of silver and gold and to substitute paper money. Now, when my father was growing up, they had gold coins. And you could take that gold, if you had it in your hand, you were independent of Uncle Sam. You could go to any merchant, and you could trade with him. And Uncle Sam couldn't tell you how much you would pay or how much he could charge. Why? Gold and silver have intrinsic value. Paper money is only worth what those who print it say it's worth. And these Marxists want to take complete independence away from us. They want to make us totally dependent on them. Well, we had silver and gold until 1932 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt took it away from us. Now, for a while after that, we were allowed to keep silver coins. But as you know, we've lost those too. And I remember growing up as a boy, whenever I'd get a dollar for my birthday, you can imagine how carefully I would examine it and read every word. And I can remember as a kid, they were silver certificates. They promised on the front that this would be redeemable in silver, a silver dollar at any federal mint. You'll notice they don't say that anymore. What they say is Federal Reserve note. And note is a legal terminology for an IOU. So this isn't really money anymore. They're just IOU given to us by the Federal Reserve. The third plank of Marx's Communist Manifesto is that a central bank must be set up to control the value of this paper money, to centralize all power and authority in the central bank, and they will determine how much your money is worth. In this context, Meyer Anschul, the founder of the Rothschild banking dynasty, is often quoted as saying, I don't care who makes your laws. Just let me coin your money, and I'll control that nation. Our founding fathers realized that. There was no provision in our Constitution for a central bank. All power to coin money and determine the value of it was given to the Congress. Well, in 1914, on Christmas Eve, when most 
of our representatives have all, had already gone home, this law was pushed through the United States Congress, the Federal Reserve Act. Now, you might think the Federal Reserve is simply another department of our federal government. The Federal Reserve is no more a part of our federal government than is Federal Express. It's the most powerful, most secretive, privately owned corporation in America. They don't even have to publish the name of their stockholders, or do they have to publish an annual balance sheet. The most secretive organization. We don't know who owns this Federal Reserve. So they control the value of these federal notes. If they wanted to value them, they just crank more of them out. Federal deficit, print more money. As they did during the presidency of Carter when our inflation was 20% a year. And when many people's life savings were wiped out simply by printing more of these, these IOUs. You want to hold people down? You want to keep them under control? Don't print money. Limit your money supply. Just stop printing it and wait till the banks with their us usurious interest Start bringing this money in, in interest, in mortgage payments. And gradually, you decrease the money supply. If you don't have money, you can't buy new uh, retooling equipment. You can't buy things in the store. You throw a nation into a depression. And this is how they brought about the depression of 1929. They just called in the money. The fourth plank, all women, and this is the Communist Manifesto, all women as well as men will be obliged to join the workforce. This is known as equality. Women can no longer be homemakers. They can no longer look after our children. They must be forced out of the home and join the workforce, although today it's called careers. They have this wonderful privilege of being career women. This was to destroy any class distinction. If you have men, husbands working, women being homemakers, that's a class distinction. All these distinctions must be destroyed in order to arrive at this classless society. Well, the last I heard, 50% of mothers with young children are forced to work outside the home. Well, it's very simple. You do it through the central bank. You just create inflation where people can't pay their mortgages, can't get their car to go to work, so mom has to go out. As Meyer Anschul said, I don't care who makes your laws. Just let me coin your money, and I'll control your nation. The fifth plank. All children must be put in public nursery school as soon as they are weaned. You see, this distinction between parents and children is exploitation. Why? Well, the parents exploit their children. They teach them their values. They teach them their love of country. They teach them uh, the Bill of Rights. They teach them their religion. Oh, no. No more. Children must be taken away from their parents, and it's very easy to do when mom is in a factory or a shop. They must be put in these daycare centers where then they can be indoctrinated from their earliest years in Marxist atheism. They're taught uh, socialism. The sixth plank, abolish traditional marriage and family structure. Where do we get our strength? We get it from our family. It's that family unity that gives us strength, gives us a feeling of independence. Well, of course, they don't want anybody to be independent of Big Brother. 
So destroy the family in the name of woman's liberation. Doesn't this sound like Betty Frieden and now? It's a Marxist front organization. They're out to destroy the family and the family unit. So I think we can already see that Marxism is diametrically opposed to all Christian values. And ultimately, that is their goal, to destroy Christianity. The seventh plank, separation of church and state. I copied that right out of the manifesto. Have you ever heard that before? Every newspaper, every federal judge, is mouthing the Communist Manifesto. There is to be no Christian influence in government. And as today we see in America, religion has become a purely private matter, as it is in the Soviet Union. In our public schools today, there's only one outlaw, and that's Jesus Christ. Our public school teachers can talk about Karl Marx, and many of them do. According to U.S. News and World Report, there are 10,000 Marxist professors in our state university pushing Marxism. They can teach about Mao Zedong, but God help them if they try to teach about Jesus Christ. The best way to teach atheism is to make God irrelevant. To push God out of our, our culture, out of our education, to teach science without God, to teach history without God, but yes, you'll bring the church in to blame it for all the problems of the past. So that our young people today in public schools are getting exactly the same atheistic, godless education as the young people of the Soviet Union. Now, the ultimate goal, and again, I'm taking this right from the manifesto for the workers' paradise, is total government control and planning of all factories, industries, merchandise, food stores, shops, you name it. Sure, the government will let you hold the deed for whatever it's worth, but they'll tell you how to run your business. Government regulation of all industry in America, which amounts to the effective abolition of all real private ownership of property. They'll get power through the ballot box, and they'll let you think that you still own this property. But they'll tell you how to use it. Abolition of all private and or home education. And we know the fight that many parents have had to teach their children at home. Big Brother doesn't want it, really. And I'm afraid that fight isn't over. No, they don't want you teaching your children your values. They want to take them all away so they can teach them their godless values. And ultimately, what they want and this is the final plank, the final goal. Abolition of all national sovereignty and individual nations and states. Globalism. A one world government under their control. And if your children attend a public or parochial quote unquote school, ask them what they know about globalism. They're being taught it today. Where is patriotism today? Where is love of country being taught today? Though all the sins of our past are being raked up to discredit our sovereignty and to prepare us to accept this one world government. 